Um, okay, so my talk is about uh, a, a proposal I've been making for about a year called Free Spirico, the free respiration ecosystem. Uh, my name is Robert L. Reed. I'm the founder of Public Inv Invention. I'm going to do something a little radical. I'm going to tell you a story. This is a science fiction story, or if you want a fantasy story, it's set in the future. Once upon a time in the near future, there were two countries called Localia and Forenia. Now, Localia and Forenia were relatively poor countries. They didn't have uh, a lot of money, but in the last 20 years, they had grown a lot. So they had about three times as many engineers as they had 20 or 30 years ago. And a young engineer named Abby lives in Localia. Now, the people of Localia um, suffer from respiratory diseases. And in particular, they have a disease that can be treated with a mythical device called a frobulator. The problem is in Localia, there aren't very many frobulators. In fact, there's not a lot of resources for anything. Abby believes with the four engineers who work for her in a Localian form called Locuspire, a firm called Locuspire, that she can make a frobulator for $500,000. So she goes to a banker or an investor in Localia, a local investor, and says, can I have $500,000? I have a business plan to make frobulators, which our people desperately need and which people are willing to pay for. And the banker says, no because it's too risky and it's too much money. But Abby can freely examine the free Spirico library, which is a lot like the open source medical supplies library, and it contains a number of designs. In particular, it has the polyvent ventilator, a CPAP machine, a PAPR, the OX O2 concentrator made by public invention, and it has a frobulator design. Now, Abby is a biomedical engineer at no charge without asking anyone's permission, without having to sign anything or give her email address or anything. She can examine the frobulator design. And when she does so, she finds things that Larry Kilizuski talked about here before. She finds a proof of concept designs. She also finds a design for manufacture. She finds third party test data documentation. And she notes that the design is a design that contains eight different modules following best open source practices. It's been designed in a very modular fashion. And so Abby thinks this is a very reasonable thing for her firm to attempt to build. So she goes back to the banker with the frobulator design in hand. And she says, can I have $200,000? And now the investor says, well, the risk is much lower because we see that frobulators have been tested. Perhaps they've been given approval in the United States with the FDA. Perhaps there is a Swiss firm making frobulators based on the same design. And so we believe it is now a reasonable investment. We'll give you $200,000 for you to make frobulators. But then disaster strikes. There is strife with Ferenia. The constitutional monarch of Localia declares that there will be no foreign parts used in local frobulators. But Abby's case is not hopeless. Abby notes that the frobulator was designed in a modular way, and only one of the eight modules uses a foreign part. She has her four engineers find a way to replace the foreign part with a local part. In a relatively short period of time, they have discovered a way to do that using only local parts. Abby then goes back to the, the country regulator and says, this fabrilator is approved in larger nations, but we changed module eight and retested it. Are you convinced it is safe? And the regulator might say no, or they might say yes, but because it's been retested and a majority of the risk has been shouldered by other firms, the regulator says yes. This allows local manufacture of the frobulator. And so Abby, who runs a local firm called Locuspire, 
starts manufacturing probulators, which saves the lives of local people. Now, how can we make this fairy tale real? Right now, this is not really possible. The stuff for this doesn't exist, but we believe the ideas discussed in this conference can make this happen. We need a library of proof of concepts designs. I claim that exists already. We just heard that Andrew Lamb uses uh, such things already. Um, we know major universities are incentive to do this kind of thing. What we need is funding for creating and documenting manufacturing plans to the point of being startup ready. That's what Larry Kilizuski uh, talked about, that design for manufacture. That in general does not exist at present. Um, we need third party organizational testing. This is an idea that other people have, have talked about as well. We need a culture of publishing test data. That is today, when it comes to hardware, particularly if you buy a proprietary medical device, you generally cannot see the test data unless it's forced to be disclosed by your FDA uh, uh, application. We need to change that in the open source world and have a culture that's completely transparent from the first day. We also need a license that forces publication of some regulatory application documents at the time of regulatory request. And public invention um, and an intellectual property attorney named Mark Jones are working on this. We call it the Sunlight Regulatory License. Um, you may have heard Pierre this morning talked about a firm called Tidepool which disclosed some of their uh, application documents for, for their FDA application. That is the first and only firm that I have ever heard doing that. And if you talk to people like Victor Sutran, he'll tell you that it's almost impossible to find examples of uh, FDA or in Europe, the CE regulatory process, which makes it very difficult and very expensive for small firms to use. Um, finally, we need to adopt standards, standards, and more standards. And the open source community has done this well. This happens in the, the realm of physical, electrical, and data standards. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And we need an emphasis on modularity for repairability and supply chain robustness. Now, as, as I've said, we're good at making proof of concept designs already. The other parts we're not very good at. And why is that? Right now, there are few incentives for taking the next step to build a startup ready design unless you're planning to actually market it. What we need is for granting agencies, like, for example, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to support doing the document and designing work that, that Larry talked about to get designs to the point where they're startup ready even if that device is not going to be manufactured by the person who receives that grant. So the idea here is those firms give a relatively modest amount of money, let's say $100,000, maybe $200,000, and a design for manufacture is made which is completely startup ready. Now, that does not give you the right to market it for an intended purpose. You have to go through FDA regulatory approval for that, but it has lowered the bar for a firm to achieve that FDA approval. So my hope is that we as a community in the next 10 years can shift to doing this. And this has been done in the case of some hobby electronics. I've held up the Arduino Uno here. That's an example. It's also the case that 3D printers, which are very, very popular devices, have seen this level of work done. It hasn't been done much for medical devices because it, it, those are just smaller markets that mo fewer people are interested in, um, in general. We need a third party testing organization. Now, um, Rohith Malia and Savia Abedi have, have articulated this idea independently. I believe Joshua Pierce art articulated this idea independently. I also mentioned it um, some years ago. I'd like to re-articulate it now. We need a financially supported professional, third-party, impartial consumer reports laboratory capable of producing accurate test reports for open source medical devices. Now, why is that? I personally believe scientists and engineers are among the most honest people in the world. 
but nobody likes to have somebody call their baby ugly. So you can't trust engineers to not be biased about the product which they built. The only way to give real transparency is to have, for example, public invention build this device and have someone not associated with public invention test it. When a third party tells you that this device is well calibrated, does what it says it's supposed to do and is reliable, then you have a way to um, trust it. This has been done in open source software. It hasn't been done very much in open source hardware, which is a little bit more expensive. Now, just like consumer reports, you need a way of funding this, which is not borne by the companies that are having their devices tested. Otherwise, their money would influence whether or not it was successful or not. And again, I believe this is, an, this is a place where um, funding organizations could support that. We need a culture of publishing test data. As I say, this is kind of established in the software industry, but it is not established in the hardware industry. And I believe that we can develop a set of best practices. Today, you don't have a good model to go on, on, on where you would publish the data, how you publish the data, what you should test. But those things can be developed in such a way that, that we can develop a, a culture where people just know how to do it. And every hardware device that falls in this realm of open medical technology, you just expect it to have to have a lot of published test data along with it before you even uh, are doing the FDA application at the time you're doing proof of concept or startup ready design for manufacture. Okay, I'm going a little quickly here. I, I can't see anyone's face, so I can't tell if you're if this is making sense or not. Um, I also want to talk about the sunlight regulatory license. You guys can um, um, see this. This is something that's a work in progress. Uh, as um, George Contreras pointed out, you kind of have this legal theory of hooks and triggers. And the sunlight regulatory license is designed to be a little different than any license that exists. Now, um, I can tell you people really don't want to see a new license because there are too many of them already and it makes things confusing. But Mark and I believe that this is necessary. The idea here is if you take this device, the Ventmon, and you try to get FDA approval to use it, you're taking our design. You got that design for free. We are going to give it to you under a condition. That is the license says that if you apply for FDA approval for a design based on this design, you have to release your application. Now, some of the things you send to that US FDA, and may be different in other countries, um, are proprietary business things which you would not wish to have released, like precisely which manufacturing firm you're gonna use for manufacturing it. And they need to know things like that, to know it, like has nickel or peanut allergies and things that, that are not particularly valuable. But other parts of it would be extraordinarily valuable to another firm that is trying to make a Ventmon, okay? Now, I know this is, can be a little weird. In America, we tend to think of business as wanting to have control and have monopolies. What the open source spirit that we're talking about here says it is you can build the device and you can take our design and you can make it. What you cannot do is monopolize it. So if firm A chooses to make a Ventmon, firm B can also make a Ventmon and firm C can also make a Ventmon. In terms of my little story, the local firm can make it, the foreign firm can also make it. Now you might say the normal way of thinking about it in American capitalism is to say, well, if other firms can make it, my profit will be so low, I have no incentive to make it. But we've just heard from many experts talk about the value of local manufacture. If we think about a particular nation, there may be tremendous reasons why that nation would prefer a local product to one made just next door, which is made by another nation. Therefore, it doesn't really matter to the local firm if it's being made in a foreign place because they have a tremendous market advantage by being local anyway. Um, so 
the sunlight regulatory license gives you the right to copy the design and demands that you give back improvements and part of your regulatory application. Why is this? Because we're trying to create a open commons of FDA or other regulatory body applications, which can be used by everybody to do a better job um, making safe and effective devices by seeing what is necessary for those applications. Now, this project needs legal scholars as volunteers. Um, if anyone here is able to volunteer, I'd like to talk to you about joining that project. There is an open secret about how open source software works. And 40 years ago, this was not true. And, and I, I was there 40 years ago, so I can say that with, with some uh, assuredness. Open source software has learned to make open standards. That is how it is the case that so many little pieces of software written by so many different people can work together so harmoniously. Some of those standards are HTTP, HTML, JSON, APIs, OAuth, SSL, the IEEE floating point standard, C itself, the I squared C, um, hardware data interface, the SPI hardware data interface, the Arduino, Arduino Uno designs, the idea of Arduino shields, which are a physical, electrical, and data standards, the Raspberry Pi, et cetera. By building standards, you allow components to work together in a modular fashion. It may be the least glamorous thing, but it's one of the things I'm most proud of personally that Public Invention has done. Um, if I died tomorrow, the production of these standards may be the most important thing that I've done. So what standards do you need for respiration? Well, we already have physical standards. This, this is a female 22 millimeter airway standard, and this is a male 22 millimeter airway standard. These things plug together. That standard's been around for 50 or 60 years. You sometimes need physical standards for hardware devices, but you also need data standards. The public invention respiration data standard is an open standard, which in a GitHub repository, anybody can use it. It is produced by this device. Those of you who saw Nathaniel Beshard's um, wonderful demo yesterday, you saw the waveforms being produced over the internet. That was done with the Ventmon. That is purge data. Any source of purge data can be mapped by that software. It doesn't have to be um, the Ventmon that produces it. In fact, um, we have simulations uh, done by some people at Helpful Engineering using Python of disease conditions, which are mapped in exactly the same way using exactly the same software. In conjunction with Eric Schultz, Dr. Eric Schultz, an Australian anesthesiologist, Public Invention has created the Public Invention Respiration Control Standard. We call that PERCS. That is a way of controlling a ventilator. Now, Every ventilator, if you're a clinician, you know, has certain settings. It has a mode, it has a PIP pressure, it has a PEEP pressure, it has a respiration rate, um, it sometimes has a volume rate, and it has an FiO2. Those things are so standardized that a majority of them can be expressed in a standard which could be used to control any ventilator. That is what we have created. That is the basis of modularity for um, separating certain things. And I'd, I'd like to give a nod to the British MHRA rapidly manufactured ventilation system. They sort of took one step towards standardizing full test suites. Not, not completely, but they did a little bit at the beginning of the crisis. It's one of the best things that they've done. So I'd like to read for you now the Free Spirico Manifesto. Um, it's just similar to the open source technology thing, but it's really more focused on what public invention is really doing. Public invention is going to build free spirit code. We're gonna do that whether we get a grant or not. We're asking for $400,000. I hope we get the grant, but I'm not gonna let that stop me if I don't get it. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated a clear and present need for a complete free libre, open source, easily repairable, widely usable, safe and effective respiratory support medical device ecosystem. That is the Free Spirico project. I ask your support for the Free Spirico project. Why is it an ecosystem? Because if you're a technologist, it's easy to understand 
that all of these devices, an oxygen concentrator, a ventilator, a BPAP machine, a CPAP machine, a PAPR, even a BVM monitor, are so closely related in what they do and have so many modules that can be reused between them. For example, oxygen control, the ability to produce air pressure in a, in a precisely controlled way, the ability to add nebulizers, the ability to add filters and dryers, all of these sort of things are so modular that it makes sense to think of them as an ecosystem of parts which fit together. Now, in order for them to fit together, you have to have free standards, which we have already produced. All of these devices could in theory be tested by the Ventmon test apparatus, which we have already made, and which any firm in the world or any person in the world is completely free to manufacture. You can take the designs right now and start manufacturing if you choose to do, to do so. This could be marketed as a sophisticated spirometer. Um, there are some other parts of this I'd like to call out. VentOS is an open source software system not made by public invention. It is a project of helpful engineering, which I volunteer for. Um, it drives the polyvent ventilator um, and could, in theory could drive any uh, ventilator. If we can build this ecosystem, we can really deliver respiration devices in a powerful way all over the world with multiple firms making devices which cooperate. So Free Spirico is not going to go into the business of making devices. We want to empower other businesses, hopefully local firms, to make the devices that we build. And so what we're doing now is we, in essence, have a proof of concept um, thing, uh, level of design for many of these devices. We're building startup ready devices in some way. Um, maybe the Ventmon is startup ready. The Polyvent is getting close to being startup ready. We need FDA or CE authority on top of that. And we're prepared to try to get that. Eventually what we want is for many firms in different nations to build designs based on our devices. Why do I say based on it? Because they're allowed to modify the designs. As George Contreras pointed out, the ability to modify is basic to open source design. If, for example, in Tanzania, you really, really need extra dust filters, you can add them. If, for example, you have to make um, a different battery supply because you're in a place where electrical supply is spotty and unreliable, you could add it to the design and, it, and you're allowed to do that. Okay, now it, this is an engineering uh, diagram. This is a universal module model of a ventilator. Um, if you're not an engineer who knows something about ventilators, you, you're gonna have to trust me on this, but basically every ventilator in the world can be thought of as an air drive, something that produces air flow and pressure in a very precise way, a sensing module that makes sure that that air is being produced correctly, a controller and a user interface. These things communicate with each other by standards which we have already produced, the public invention respiration control standard, the public invention respiratory data standard. All of these things allow a clinician to treat a non-invasively or invasively ventilated patient. Now, you might ask, how realistic is this? Okay, public invention was less than $100,000 raised over the last three years in partnership with Helpful Engineering based on our volunteers has already created the Ventmon tester, the Vent OS operating system, the Polyvent ventilator, the PERDS data standard, the PERCS control standard, the OX, which is our oxygen concentrator, which is not, um, not as well developed as some of the other parts, and vent display. Vent display is the universal test display for ventilators, which you saw in Nathaniel Beshard's um, demo. It shows live waveforms, much, very much like a clinical ventilator display. It includes other test things like um, rise time of the waveform and can um, also demonstrate anomaly um, events. That's open source software, which any maker of ventilators can use without my permission. You don't need it. That's the beauty of open source software. I, I'm not sure 
uh, well, there, for example, there's a French firm called MUR that makes a pretty good ventilator or Rice University makes the Apollo BVM. They don't have these kinds of displays right now. If they chose to, they could use vent display as the software mechanism without asking my permission because it's all 100% free, open, modular, and reusable. So in summary, I believe this is an ambitious program. Can we do it? I believe, yes, we can. We can create and establish standards. We can create libraries. We're not doing it well today, but as a community, we can create designs for manufacture and we can create a free culture of FDA applications and thereby over a decade, create a culture of open source medical devices, which truly democratize important therapies and create universal business opportunities. What public invention needs to make this happen is $400,000 and volunteers. And we especially need volunteers who can lead whole teams. So we really need people who have the energy, the drive and the kind of mid-career knowledge to run a team that's making one of these components. But if you look at the bigger picture, what does the whole world need to make this happen? I think this conference has shown that the world needs cooperation more than anything else. We need to stifle the not invented here syndrome, which, which everybody has. I have it, everyone here has it. We need to just put it in an iron chest and drop it in the bottom of the ocean. The time for competing across national boundaries or across teams or between universities is over. We need to all cooperate. We need technical leadership. We need dedicated leaders who can, can devote time and energy to this. And we also need policy leadership. I talk a lot about engineering. However, we need volunteers who can write policy documents who can be good graphic artists, who can be good videographers, who can be good documenters. We need all kinds of skill working in this. In my opinion, policy and technical work have to go together. I am focused more on technical things because I'm sort of a technical person, but it's very, very important that we attract and retain volunteers who have all kinds of skills, including the ability um, to write, to lead, um, and obviously medical skills as well. Okay, so that ends my talk. And I have not been able to look at uh, anything. So let me try to moderate myself. What will be the status of works done under the COVID plays? That's something else. Rob, your presentation content and vision is out of this world. Thank you. Great vision, passion, objective. Great on you. Well done from South Africa. Thank you, Reggie. Um, Megan or Sabia, if you're here, uh, were there any questions in the Zoom chat that I may have missed? I didn't see any. I think everybody okay. was absorbing it, but um, well done, Rob. I really enjoyed the presentation. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so we are just a little bit behind time, but I'm just gonna push through here. Um, so um, Dr. Sanjay Gadasali is gonna go later after uh, Dr. Nareen Ahmed, who I'm going to try to introduce um, now, I, but I want to remind people right now, um, uh, I, I also will go to Rehive once I've introduced um, uh, our keynote speaker. So our keynote speaker is Dr. Nareen Ahmed. After she is done, we're, we're going to come back here, and we made a slight change in the program. Sanjay Gadasali, who's a medical doctor, is going to give an investor Q&A here in the webinar. So it will be here. And then when it dies down, I'd like everybody to go to Rehive, if you want, to continue talking about the conference. Yesterday, there were, con there were conversations going on until about six. It was, there was a lot of really, really good conversations. And remember, the purpose of this conference is to change the world. We want you to sign the, the Open Medical Technology um, Manifesto, but even if you disagree with it, which is completely reasonable, we want you to meet people, form new connections, form new alliances, and decide um, what, uh, how you can carry the world forward. 